Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with legendary New York City drummer and composer Chris Parker. He opened up about his new 2022 CD called Tell Me. The long road that he's traveled on for the past 50 years is really full of bends and curves, and he has one creative tour to force, and he has done a lot. He was born in Chicago, started playing drums at 3, performing his first professional gigs at 11, and at 19, he started recording and touring with the blues great Paul Butterfield, and then broke into the the New York studio scene in 1970. And at that point, he started doing records, movie scores, and even filling the drum chair at Saturday Night Live. He's got a great story. Enjoy. Well, hey, thanks again for taking a minute out for the show. I appreciate it. My pleasure. So let's talk about your latest CD. Actually, before we get to your latest CD, tell me. Talk to me a little bit about how you survived COVID. It was quite a time and, you know, changed all of us. So... How did you get through it, and how did it change you subsequently? I got through it by uh, sort of stepping up my routine of, of practicing and really um, taking the time to attack things that I never had the time to really spend um, the proper amount of time with before. You know, not only rudiments, but um, exercises, and I made myself a list of things that I wanted to be able to play better certain feels and certain time signatures and brushes, different kinds of dynamics. Um, and I had a, I have a practice room in uh, Midtown, and I had everything set up there with all, you know, numerous books and a tape and a cassette machine and my phone, and I just sort of dove into it and practiced a lot of things that I I had never really addressed before. You know, I always faked it or got by or was able to play it for a few minutes enough to to do the record date or do the jingle or whatever it was. Really spent some time getting comfortable and finding new um, paths to those exercises and new paths to my own playing and stuff. The, The... Live gigs, you know, completely dried up, but there were a lot of uh, Zoom lessons. I was teaching some guys in Finland for a while, and I and I took on a, um, they call it Grammy U, you know, the Recording Academy pairs you up with a with a kid and you mentor him. So I did a couple of those where, you know, it's a Zoom meeting or we were able to meet in person a couple of times at a studio and try to share my experience and share my knowledge and and also, you know, get input from him, uh, what he was listening to and the kind of things that turned him on. And this one kid really wants to go into film scoring, you know, so we listened to a lot of film scores and I turned him on to people that he hadn't heard about before. And by the end, he was doing a sample film scoring, you know, taking a a scene from a movie and adding his own music to it, that was very informative, too. I think I I had it in late 2019 before everybody was calling it COVID. I had a horrible bronchitis and cough, and I was laid up for like a week with flu symptoms and everything like that. And in retrospect, my doctor said, I think you were one of the early uh, patients, because I had been working really hard and I was kind of run down and I guess I was open to it, but survived and got all my vaccines <laughs> and I'm fine now. I just came back from Japan, which is still very much, you know, masked up and testing and they take your temperature everywhere and they uh, are very strict about uh, crowds and the six foot distancing and all that stuff. So, it's nice to be back in the city where it's a little looser. How did you fare? Oh, I got it early on. My son and I got it, and um, my wife and uh, stepdaughter didn't. We actually masked up and kind of separated. So, But, yeah, man, overall it was like, you know, we had a monopoly on things. You had to find a way to survive and to get through it. And, and I think there was a lot of silver linings that went along with all of the woes that everybody went through. You know, it was just a matter of, I think what I figured out is whoever you were before COVID began was only going to get magnified. So if you were the type that was already negative, 
it was going to get magnified in that direction. If you were positive and you try to look at that glass half full and try to get things going in the right direction, there was there was a good chance you were going to be successful at it. That's true. That's very true, yeah. But this album coming out now, as we all know, the world's kind of opening up, live gigs are happening. This has to feel really good to have new material out and to be able to perform live and all of that. It is indeed, yeah. It's um, A lot of these tunes were written during the lockdown, and they were germs of ideas that I hadn't fully developed yet. So, again, I had the time to kind of stretch out and really devote sec- whole sections of the day to fleshing out, you know, what I wanted to do with a, with a certain tune. So this album is a realization of, of all that uh, energy put into it. So, yeah, it's great. You're from Chicago originally. Talk to me a little bit. You started playing drums at three, uh, performing at 11. So, you know, you were, you, everything started pretty early for you. It must have been in your DNA. Maybe so. <laughs> yeah, my father played soprano sax and clarinet, and he, and when he got out of the army, he swapped uh, both of those for a, a great old set of drums, you know, a 26 inch bass drum and a, Black Beauty snare and this uh, hilarious Chinese symbol and a funky old hi hat and stuff and I just gravitated towards them. Uh, they were set up in the house and I gravitated towards them immediately. Um, he has to be able to take a reel to reel tape into Grand Central, the train station, and turn that reel to reel tape into a disc. So he's got a couple of discs uh, that he made of me playing along with Lionel Hampton and. Uh, along with Monk Records and with Charlie Mingus Records and just playing along with the records. But that's how I started. And then by by 11, I was backing up strippers in this club in Brookfield, Connecticut, um, with a guy who was my barber and just happened to mention, you know, that he needed a drummer. And another friend of his said, well, Chris plays drums. He's been playing in the band, and he's he his father plays jazz all the time. He said, "Well, what the heck? Let's try him out." So that was the beginning of a of a couple of years backing up dancers and playing with. Sometimes it was an organ trio, organ drums and tenor, or sometimes it was tenor, bass, guitar. Uh, it kind of changed. And sometimes we had a vocalist, but it was a uh, it was a great experience, uh, musically and anatomically. I'm curious, what was the first live jazz show you ever saw that blew you away, that made you think, that's something I'd like to do? My father took me to see Monk, uh, who was playing at the Danbury, the Palace Theater, I think it was called then, and it was the band with Ben Riley and Charlie Rouse, and it was unforgettable, you know, because I had been listening to the records a lot. My father had all his records, and to hear him, to see him live, you know, his um, presentation and the way he played piano and the compositions themselves, and I love Ben Riley. It was great. It was fascinating. And then I saw Lionel Hampton with a big band soon after that, where he danced on the floor tom at the end of the set you know, which I couldn't figure out how he did that, but I realized later he had a piece of plywood on that floor, Tom, so he could tap dance on it. Then I started going into the, taking the train into the city and going to the Village Gate or to Cafe Agogo, uh, to the Five Spot, you know, any place that would let me in. And that was not, you know, not always the case. I couldn't always get in, but I could stand outside. And I heard Roy Haynes, and I heard Max Roach, and I heard um, Art Farmer, and Chico Hamilton, and I heard a lot of lot of a lot of music in the city while I was still going to school. So I knew that's what I wanted to do. You know, you get to New York and and the studio scene in the '70s. You know, there's a lot of things that are on your resume from Saturday Night Live, Paul Butterfield, and I'm curious in those early days of molding you as a musician. What is it that you remember from that time period that really sticks with you today? Like like lessons that you hearken to? Paul Butterfield was great, and he was very uh, paternal towards me. I was 
19 or something, you know, and that was like my first really professional gig where I went on the road for a good period of time. I had played in a, a rock band that made a record before that, but he would, his music was really challenging and the rest of the band was very professional. Started with Merle Saunders on organ. He was replaced by this guy, Ronnie Barron from New Orleans who was an amazing keyboard player. The bass player was great, Billy Rich, and the guitarist was great, Amos Garrett, and Jeff Moldar was in the band, and they were all, you know, accomplished musicians. So I was, I wanted to be a sponge and just soak everything up. And what sticks with me to this day is that that challenge, you know, the feeling, how good it feels to play with people who are better than you and you're trying to reach that level, you know, so you're really striving to not only keep up, but to to get to that, that level of expression, you know, and that sticks with me to this day. You know, I always want to play with people who are really accomplished and better than me uh, in terms of their uh, facility on the instrument and their education, all that stuff. That's always the most inspiring place I can be in, you know, to have somebody who's really a killer pianist or a killer bass player uh, or or saxophonist, you know, who really knows his stuff and, and try to support them at the level that they're used to being supported, you know, and that's a very uh, driving force for me. The rest of the time... Uh, if I wasn't actually performing with Paul Butterfield, I was listening, you know, listening to everything I could get my hands on, all kinds of music. I had already been exploring New Orleans and the history of New Orleans and, you know, from Louis Armstrong on up into those drummers, Jim Black and uh, Ed Blackwell and uh, Freddie Staley and... <laughs> Fred Below, all these great, and Baby Dawes and Sid Catliff, you know, all these drummers uh, that came from that area or from Chicago, you know, and, and those styles, you know, I wanted to absorb all that stuff. And that sticks with me to this day. I'm always listening to a new guy, a younger guy, or somebody that I didn't discover before. I've been reading this biography of uh, Louis Moreau, Scott Chalk, who uh, was a pianist from New Orleans who toured the world in the 1860s and 1870s and wrote all this amazing music that that predates, you know, Scott Joplin and and is 40 or 50 years before Louis Armstrong and Ragtime and all that. And the compositions are amazing. He had a, he had a Haitian uh, nanny and a French mother and father was from New Orleans, I think. So he had all these musical influences going on, and he gravitated towards piano and started writing his own compositions. That's They're amazing to listen to. There's a couple of CDs out with guys playing his music, and I got a book of his music myself, and I'm slowly reading through it. But he, the rhythms that he incorporated and the harmonic ideas you know, were well along with uh, European classical music, but he had this different take on it. And this is a guy I knew nothing about until about six months ago. So it's it's fascinating. You know, that's what the, the beautiful thing about music. There's always something new to learn. You know, there's always some new facet of it. And not only in America, but the whole world. You know, every, every part of the world has got its own music. And... Uh, it's always illuminating to dive into it, you know, and hear what other people are doing rhythmically and harmonically. I, it's great. I love music for that reason. So, you know, the one thing that's been key about you and your career is the longevity, and you clearly love what you do. What is it that you look forward to the most every day you wake up and you get to be a professional musician? What is it that gets you going? <laughs> I always wake up with a with a tune in my head, somebody's song or something that I played recently or something just kicks in and the first first thing I do is go to the piano and 
try to figure it out. Um, what did I wake up singing? You know, and sometimes it's a, a Beatles tune, or sometimes it's some uh, obscure uh, Professor Longhair thing, uh, like Big Chief. I was trying to figure out this morning, or I or I just hear a, a germ of an idea, you know, and I go to the piano and and try to flesh it out. What am I hearing? You know, it's a it's a groove like this, and it's got this kind of changes. It's a minor thing. It's in six eight. Uh, and I make a little recording, you know, on my phone, make a little voice memo. Uh, maybe I come back to it later in the day or, or the next week or something. But a lot of tunes have started that way. And I look forward to going down to the studio and practicing. You know, I have a warm-up routine that's like 45 minutes or an hour. And then um, I just sit at the drums, you know, and something comes out. Something always comes out. And I look, look at my... Uh, phone and three or four hours have gone by <laughs> so that's like my favorite part of the day you know is uh exploring the drums some more or sitting at the piano i look forward to that <laughs> every day uh, this past saturday i had a gig with my dad who's 95 and he has a uh, jazz group uh soprano sax trombone piano bass and a vocalist. So he wanted me to to sort of sit in with him for the evening and that was a that was totally a ball, you know, cuz they're playing back home in Indiana and Caravan and uh Night in Tunisia and uh Don't Be That Way, you know, like standard tunes from the 50s and 40s and 50s uh and it was very comfortable. It was great. And it's great sitting alongside him. You know, we, we had a ball. Everyone has a perception of you, your family, your friends, your fans, but ultimately you live your life. Who do you think you are? <laughs> <laughs> I'm a guy who is um, striving to be the, the best musician and the best person I can be, you know, um, I try to do good every day and try to make some good music or try to be a part of some good music. That's the, my definition of success is uh, to be with a group of musicians and communicate our endeavor to an audience and have them uh, appreciate it, you know, or pick up on it or be moved by it or look out and see them grooving to it, you know, they're tap, wagging their heads or tapping their feet. Uh, that's a successful day. That's, um, and I'm a guy who, uh, <laughs> who loves doing that. You know, I love performing. I love playing music with either, you know, by myself in my studio or preferably with other people, you know, recording it and documenting that uh, that meeting. You know, here we were two weeks ago in, in New Jersey in the studio and we were handed this music and we were able to come up with something that was going to work for the film that everybody was happy with and got uh, invigorated by. You know, that's, that's a big successful day for me. Beautiful. Chris, man, thank you for opening up. Thanks for talking about the new album and your life and music. Good luck with everything as we move forward. All right. Thank you very much, Joe. Thanks for uh, calling. Thanks for listening and tuning in to another Neon Jazz interview, where we give you a bit of insight into the finest players in New York City, Kansas City, and spots all over the world, giving fans all that jazz. Thanks to Chris for his time, music, and story. If you want to hear more interviews, go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino on the iTunes Store. Visit Neon Jazz at YouTube.com. And for everything Neon Jazz, go to the neonjazz.blogspot.com. Until next time, enjoy the jazz, my friends. Neon Jazz.